Well, thank you. First of all, thank you all for being here today. Um, I appreciate you all coming out uh, this afternoon. So we can talk a little bit about the strategic plan. Uh, now, for the last about a year and a half, the National Association of System Heads, or NASH, has been discussing the power of systems and how systems can help move higher education forward in the United States. Uh, but today, we're really going to focus on the power of our system, the power of the SIU system. But before we get started, I first want to start with a few highlights from the last couple of years. Now, I should note before I start the list of highlights, well, in almost every area that's important, we've made progress during the last couple of years, during a particularly challenging period of time. We still have a long way to go on each of these goals, and I'll kind of reinforce that um, on each one of them. Certainly navigating through a global pandemic was a challenge. Whenever I tell anybody I started on March 1st, 2020, the first response is, oh, I am so sorry. <laughs> now, let me point out, I'm not. Because I was fortunate to be here with outstanding health professionals across the system, an outstanding school of medicine whose advice I relied on consistently. I didn't have that at my past institution. And because we had that, we were able to have incredibly low infection rates. And according to the last time we looked at it, actually the lowest infection rates of any university in Illinois across the SIU system. Um, so we were able to do that. That allowed us to do more things in person where we particularly needed to. Um, and in fact, when we went to in-person classes, we generally, generally saw a decrease in infection rates the longer we were in person. Um, that's not true for every institution across the United States, I can guarantee you that. Now, how did that happen? It really was not just listening to that good advice, but everybody taking personal responsibility. That's faculty, staff, and students who I think some of us had less faith in than they really deserved. Um, they did a great job. And because of that, we got through this pandemic really, really well as a system. And so thank you to all of you who did your part in helping us move forward. Second thing that we did, you know, when we started the pandemic, every news report said enrollment at universities was going to go down. And it did. Nationally, enrollment has gone down and gone down at a faster rate than it was going down before the pandemic. So that is actually true. However, we have done very well in the last two years across the SIU system. When you look at new freshmen, so new students coming in, we increased by over 26 percent. I have not seen another institution or another system in the country that increased by that rate during that period of time. Again, during the most challenging period of time. Um, now, we've really been able to stop that dramatic drop in enrollment that we've seen in recent years. Uh, if you look at the prior decade, so the 2010 to 2019, both campuses were actually down over 10% in FT enrollment. We now are reversing that trend by bringing in more freshmen. It's now a matter of retaining and continuing that success going forward. And if we do, we will continue to see increases actually in overall enrollment. In fact, this year, there are only three public universities in the state of Illinois that were up in overall enrollment. And one of them is right here, SIUE. So good job on that. Next thing that we heard was during the pandemic that the financial position of institutions was going to decline in multiple ways. One of those was certainly in fundraising. That fundraising would not be say, successful or possible during a global pandemic. We've kind of proven that wrong. We've not only hit our goals, we had record days of giving. Um, at SIUC and just this last week at SIUE. So a big round of applause for that record day of giving last week here at SIUE. <laughs> if you look at the growth of our enrollment, last, uh, group, excuse me, endowment last year, it was up $52 million across both the foundations. So a huge increase, about a 30% increase in the endowment during the last, um, last fiscal year. Um, on top of that, we've seen increased state support. So after years of disinvestment, budget impasse, we actually have a 5% supplement for this fiscal year that's coming from the state, as well as a 5% increase going forward. We also saw a $3.5 billion earmark for the Belleville Initiative, which is heavily focused on SIUE, a support for the Fam Farm Family Resource Initiative, another $200,000 there. And also there was $10 million given to IBHE for the Behavioral Workforce Training Center, which the School of Medicine is the lead on. So overall, a very successful legislative session, all of which helps us out financially. And after several years of decline, the net position of the system has actually increased over the last three years and pretty dramatically increased over the last few years. We've also increased our unrestricted cash position, which had been declining and really in a state of crisis during the budget impasse. So all of those are positive signs. As a result of that, our bond rating has gone up. So we are 
out of the junk bond rating uh, scale. Um, we're not at AAA yet. So again, this is one where we still have room to grow, but we're out of that area and we're actually in a much better position. This is important as we borrow money to be in that better position going forward. That'll make it cheaper for us to borrow money and again, help our financial position even more. Um, with this financial success, what it's allowed us to do is start doing some of the things relative to the goals I'll talk about in a second. Last year, we had a 2% salary increase across the system. That is the first time we've had a salary increase across the entire system since 2014 of that level. So it's been a long time coming. Again, still a lot of work to do and a lot of work needs to continue to happen there, but we're starting to move in a positive direction. In July, the board established both the Office for Community Engagement and the Institute for Rural Health. Now I want to talk more about these in a few minutes because they're heavily a part of our plan. But this is really part of our increased commitment to support the region um, that is already, and this is really already having the impact on the people of Illinois. So even in the short period of time that these operations have been going, we've seen a positive impact. In fact, tomorrow at the board meeting, the Institute for Rural Health will be talking about some of the things that they're doing and some of the things they're planning going forward. We'll also discuss in a few minutes our commitment to anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, well, again, we're still on a journey and still have a long way to go. We've been very public about our commitment and we maintain this focus when, frankly, a lot of other institutions did not. We have new leadership and by new leadership, I mean we actually have chief diversity officers that sit as part of the leadership team, both at the system level and each of the campuses. Um, we've had conversations of understanding. We started that back after the murder of George Floyd, but have continued that even through this semester and plan on continuing that going forward. So. We've not shied away from having the conversations. We've been very open. We tape them. We present them to everybody, very transparent about that. We changed our scholarship programs. A lot of places talked about going test optional for admissions, but that really only gets you part of the way there. Going test optional on scholarships also allows more students to have access to financial support for merit, really based on their success in high school, which frankly is a considerably better predictor of success in college than the standardized test scores. And we changed our hiring processes, which has started to have an impact on who we hire. We've had, we just completed a campus climate survey, and again, uh, great turnout for that, so thank you very much for all who completed that. We also have developed a scorecard related to anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we'll be reporting on that in the near future. Related to new leadership, we had a few years ago when I arrived, we had a lot of interims. Uh, we had a lot of people retiring, so lots of positions to fill. And we've been very successful in filling those positions with high quality and diverse group of individuals. Um, and we've had to adjust the way we do searches. I can remember distinctly in March 2020 saying, I will never hire a senior administrator that I don't meet face to face. Then I hired three of them that I had never met face to face <laughs> um, and changed the way we did things because we had to. And in fact, in 2020, and again, I was following this fairly closely, a lot of institutions shut their searches down, said it's not possible to do when we went remote. Um, we completed two of those searches, both the chancellor at Carbondale, as well as the vice president position that Dr. Gupchuk holds, were done entirely during that kind of pandemic period where we were in shutdown. So we moved forward this uh, fall, we moved forward on the search for the chancellor here, and really beat almost everybody else to the hiring point, which was important to get the best candidate. I will say in all four of those hires, we hired our first choice, which is not something you can always say. So being able to do things the way we did them allowed us again to hire high quality individuals. And we've seen more cross uh, campus collaboration and really working together. And the strategic plan is a great example of that. We had about 150 people involved, either in working groups or on the strategic planning committee. So I wanna personally thank the leads, leaders of that, Vice President Gupchup, Dean Pollitz, and Dr. Butler for their leadership and, and throughout this process, but really everybody who was involved, including I think the 4,000 people who filled out surveys relative to, so we had a lot of involvement. Now, they, we'll say this is a first for SIU. As far as I know, going back in history, I don't think we've ever got together as a system and developed a plan. So when we talk about this plan in just a second, it's important to point out this is not my plan, this is your plan. You all had a part in this, all had an opportunity to have input into this, and this was a collaborative effort. Um, and actually you might be surprised how little of a role I played in all of this other than occasionally getting feedback uh, from how it was going and occasionally giving a little bit of input, but mostly this is the plan that you all developed and I'm very happy with what came out of it, which once again is an example of why we need to trust our colleagues. Uh, they do a great job. So I wanna talk about a few things relative to the plan. We're gonna present the six goal areas um, as well as the objectives, um, but you may be disappointed, I'm not going to read them 
word for word. I trust your ability to read. Um, and if you want to read the whole plan, it's all out there on the, on the system webpage. Um, so one that I'm going to present a little bit differently. Um, second thing I want to point out on the plan, that this is a system plan, not a campus plan. Those are two very distinct things, and it's important they be distinct. In fact, if there was one area that I had a lot of feedback on was sometimes I saw objectives that were really, no, this is a system thing, this is a campus thing, we don't need to be involved with this at the system level. So we tried very hard to focus on where can we add value as a system, where can we add value by collaboration, not taking things away. And sometimes there's gonna be differences between the campuses, and that's okay. I always say, we should be the same when it makes sense to be the same, and when it makes sense to be different, we should be different. And I'm not, a, and I have no problem with that. The other thing I will say with the plan is you see it, is that these goals clearly overlap. And so sometimes to me it's not so important whether this fits under goal one or goal two or goal three as far as some of the objectives, because in many cases if we do these right, they actually will hit on multiple goals. And so again, keep that in mind as we're going through it. Now goal one, academic innovation and student success. Our top priority is and always must be our students and providing them the best educational experiences possible. Like many of our system goals, there's kind of unique activities that each campus will do, and again, that's a good thing. But we also want to find ways through system-wide collaboration to expand opportunities for students and improve the experiences that they have. Now, some of the examples that are kind of embedded in the objectives, one certainly is the SIU System Flex program which is that the idea is to provide more opportunities for students to take courses, courses from each campus and thereby, thereby improve their overall experience and increase degree attainment. Now we have a task force that just gave me a report yesterday, so we're working on uh, that as we speak, so we're moving forward with that. But this is important and actually something that a lot of systems are already doing. So this is not an unusual thing, there's models out there. In fact, the working group or the task force that was working on this has used a lot of those examples to help guide us. But this, again, will provide opportunities for students to get through more efficiently and maybe to find a class or something of interest on another campus that they wouldn't have been able to access otherwise. Second thing I want to say that's kind of embedded in a lot of this is an idea of sharing what works. There are programs to support different demographic groups among our students, things we do relative to student advising, career counseling, industry partnerships, research experiences, all kinds of different high-impact practices where maybe one campus has come up with something that's been very effective. There's no reason why we should be able to take that and expand that to the other campus. So sharing ideas that have been effective, and again, I can think of numerous ones here that would be good for SIUC to model after. So again, where can we share experiences? Where can we learn from each other as much as possible? Now, if we do this well, what does success look like? One, we'll be able to attract more students. We'll see greater student success in terms of retention and graduation rates greater student satisfaction, and greater success for students after graduation, all the things we should be monitoring. The second goal is related to anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion. As I mentioned before, in May of 2020, institutions across the country reacted to the murder of George Floyd. Now, I will say at the time, many were concerned that as this passed and time went on, things would return to normal, no progress would be made. And frankly, as I look across higher education across the country, in many cases, I think that has been the case. We wanted to be different. Now, why is this important? Because I get asked this question some time. We must recognize that inequities exist in higher education. If we look at university pre presidents, they're 80% white and 70% male. Senior leadership is 87% white and 60% male. Full professors are 80% white and 68% male. Actually, 53% are white males. While this data is actually better than Fortune 500, it's certainly nothing to be proud of, and it definitely shows that we need to do better going forward. If we look at the student data, we would find equity ex gaps exist in both graduation and retention rates at almost every institution in the country. There's only a small handful at which that's not the case. Now, we made a public commitment to be an anti-racist organization. We're the only system I know who've made that commitment, and there's only a few higher education institutions that have been as public about it. And this means, what does this mean? It means being active in addressing and changing areas where structural racism and bias exist and where we fall short of true equity. So, some things that we're gonna work on. One is certainly examining our policies, procedures, and practice, the way we do things. Uh, we often hear in higher education, well, we've always done it this way. 
Well, if you want to get the same results, just keep doing things the way you've always done them. So our current approach got us to where we are today. That means we need to look at what we're doing and see if there's a better way of doing it in almost everything that we do. Uh, we need to improve our education relative to anti-racism, diversity, and equity inclusion for all members of our community. That means providing educational experiences for our students, for our faculty, for our staff. It also means continuing those conversations of understanding and other activities like that as we move forward. We need to look for areas of inequity through our campus climate surveys and through our scorecard that I mentioned earlier. And when we find those, we need to find ways to address those. It also means implementing programs to improve the recruitment and retention of diverse group of faculty, staff, and students. And when we find ones that work, we need to expand them and offer them to more students across the system. Now, if we do well, what does it look like? We'll have fewer equity gaps when we look at our data related to faculty, staff, and students. We'll also have a greater sense of belonging among members of our community. And as I've said many times before, I believe this is an area where SIU can be a national model. We have the right people and places at all levels. We're the right, in the right place to accomplish something significant. If we are able to do this, not only will it have an impact on SIU and raise our profile as an as, as a educational system, it also will have a benefit for all of higher education. Goal three, community impact. As I always say, as a public institution, we have an obligation to not only serve our students, but to serve our region. There are a number of communities, certainly in our region, that can benefit from collaboration with the SIU system. And frankly, we can benefit from those collaborations as well. Some of those examples include the previously mentioned Office for Community Engagement, bringing together the resources and expertise across the system to help communities, particularly those that are distressed in our region. Again, this is an area where we can not only have an impact on the region, but we can learn from those experiences. We can provide opportunities for students. This can be a win for everybody. The Institute for Rural Health is an area where we have a strength as a system. There are a few educational systems that have as many strong health-related programs as we do across the SIU system. So if we can do this and work together, we can work on improving health outcomes in the region reduce, and reducing health inequities, expanding the healthcare workforce, and developing new programs that address the unique healthcare needs of our region. We also can do things to support local business development and economic growth. We're currently doing that. We are providing that support now, but we want to find ways by working together that we can expand what we can do to help out again with business development and growth in the region. Finally, we can collaborate to improve available educational opportunities across the lifespan. So we provide more opportunities for people in the region to enhance their skills and become a bigger part of the workforce. So if we do this well, we will see positive growth and improvement in the quality of life in the region. We will expand opportunities for our students as well as for our faculty and staff. Goal four. Research, creative activity, and partnerships. Across the system, we have a commitment to research and cre creative activity. It is an important part of the work of faculty as well as many staff members, and frankly, it contributes to the overall student experience, which we talked about earlier. The goal and the plan is to expand those opportunities and grow in this area from collaborations across the system and partnerships with groups outside of our system. So some of the examples of things we can do is increase opportunities for faculty, and others to find those with common research interests. I think there's an activity actually next week of bringing people together to find those who may have similar interests and expand those opportunities for research. Can't tell you how many times I had great research, lines of research that started in an airport discussion with a faculty member from another institution that would not have happened without those types of discussions. We need to find ways to enhance those more. We need to improve the ease of obtaining and administering grants and external contracts. That's a challenge on most campuses. There's things we can do better to support our faculty who are getting those grants, and also finding ways to support when those are across multiple institutions, which sometimes can be more challenging to deal with. We need to share resources that support research and creative activity. Sometimes we have access to resources on one at one institution that would be valuable to another institution, or there are ways to expand that access. We need to facilitate connections with potential external partnerships. Again, much of the research many of us do, myself included, has involved working with external groups. What can we do as a system to expand those opportunities um, and get more outside organizations interested in working with us? And finally, expanding opportunities for collaborative PhD programs. 
This is a great, again, benefit for the student to be able to utilize the expertise that exists across the system. It's also a benefit to faculty, and again, from a personal standpoint, I would not be where I am today as a researcher if it was not for the work I was able to do with the PhD students I've had over the years. So I know it's a valuable opportunity for everybody who's involved. If we do this well, we will see growth in research and creative activity, including obtaining more and greater external grants, and we'll see particularly a growth in collaborative activities. We'll expand external partnerships that are mutually beneficial, and we'll increase opportunity for students to engage in meaningful research and creative activity. Goal five. So when speaking of students and the quality of their experiences when they're here, it is directly impacted by having high quality faculty and staff. So in order for us to be successful, we need to recruit and retain high quality faculty and staff. And we must continually do, th do things to ensure that this is a place where people can be successful and satisfied in their work. So some examples of things that we need to do. This certainly starts with our recruitment. We must continue to look for ways to make our processes better and more equitable. Um, and again, organizations that have been willing to change their approach have been able to improve both the quality and diversity of their pool of candidates and who they hire. We can do a better job. We can provide support after recruitment to increase the chances that employees will be successful and satisfied in the work. Many of the suggestions within the strategic plan include improving better and more intentional mentorship, providing training and educational opportunities that support advancement. In fact, we've been working with the staff group at the system level on a leadership program that will help develop leadership skills for staff. That's just one example of that. Uh, training and educational opportunities that support the growth, growth of supervisors. This is something in higher education we need to do a better job of. I always tell the story, I went one day from being an assistant professor with no supervisory uh, expectations to being the department chair the next day, and my training was they gave me the keys. Um, we can do a little bit better than giving you the keys. Uh, but that's an important part of both their growth and actually the growth that they are able to help their employees with. Uh, rewarding actions and behaviors that support our goals. So when people are doing things that are benefiting the system and the goals we have in this plan, as well as the campus plans, they need to be rewarded. If it's done well, we'll have more satisfied faculty and staff, reduce turnover, more opportunities for advancement for those who stay, a more diverse group of faculty and staff that better represent the diversity among our students, as well as our society. Goal six. Now, only a former accountant would think there's no better way to end our discussion of goals than to focus on the exciting topic of infrastructure and financial security. But in all seriousness, a commitment to this area actually allows us to do all those other things. Without this, none of those other things are possible. So we need to do this today in order to accomplish our previous goals. Um, and in, embedded in this, I should say, is a commitment for me and from the leadership in the system to being transparent as much as legally possible and being accountable to the goals that we set. So some examples of things we've talked about doing. I'm improving technology and searching for ways through collaboration to decrease the cost of that technology. Focusing on initiatives that can increase revenue while also maintaining control or reducing costs. So in other words, return on investment increases. Tying our funding to our goals. We can't do everything. Whenever we're talking about funding something, we could say, how is it either helping us accomplish the goals in the campus plan or in the system plan? And then working collaboratively to develop initiatives to increase sustainability. If it's done well, we will maintain our financial stability and actually improve it from where we are today, increase our efficiencies, and increase the resources we have available to support all of those other goals that I talked about earlier. Now, what comes next? First of all, anybody who's worked with me before knows I'm not big on a plan that sits on a shelf. We've developed a plan, now we have to implement it, and we have to be very thoughtful and focused on implementing that plan. To that end, right now, we are putting together implementation teams that will continually monitor the implementation of the plan, monitor our progress, and adjust things as necessary. This is a living plan, and at times we may say, okay, that's not working, let's go in a different direction. We need those implementation teams, and I can't remember how many implementation teams we have, but it's quite a few, so there's lots of opportunity to continue to be involved in this. Uh, the metrics are being developed to measure our progress. 
we should be reporting on a regular basis on how we're doing. And when we fail to achieve goals, whatever those goals may be, then we need to relook at what we're doing and try to find a better way to do it. And finally, I will say there is a role for everyone. I've been asked often by people once we introduce a strategic plan, what role can I play? Well, I've just outlined a whole lot of things, and almost everybody, and I not every, almost everyone can actually play a role in some way, shape, or form. So that's where we are as, as far as a system with our strategic plan. That's the direction we have going forward. Again, I thank you for your time. That'd probably be a combination of goals, so I'm not sure I'd necessarily just put it under community impact, but I think that's certainly something we can look at. I don't know, whether, did that come up, Grish, you know, in the discussions? I don't think that specifically came up, but, uh, you know, certainly the Office of Community Engagement can look at that. Uh, and Maddie, right? Yeah. Yes. So, you know, one of the things we could do is, in the system-wide student advisory committee, that's something we can work on. Because you're talking specifically about students, right? Yeah. Yes. So we need to talk about that. Yeah, and then again, I think connecting with, somewhat with the community agencies, which again, I think the Office of Community Engagement can help with that as well. So it's certainly, I know, a, a priority and a need. Um, so again, we can help with that. Um, but again, we want to work closely with the campus too, because a lot of that can be kind of local within each campus as far as what some of those community resources are. But we can help to facilitate it some from the system level. Yeah, and again, some of this, I'll try to distinguish between the two, both the system and the campus. So again, the campus you know, budget, how they handle that within there would be a kind of a campus level decision. But I think thinking about making sure that how we do budgeting on a campus level ties to the goals of the campus plan and the system plan makes all kinds of sense. Um, as far as how to avoid um, padding budgets, I think that gets into, and have been other institutions have done this, just a little bit more scrutiny about how we do things um, you know, and, and, and I think that gets into everything. I will just give you an example of when I was at, um, when I was a dean, one of the things that was traditional is every time we lost a faculty member, we replaced them in the same area without a lot of thought. I changed that whole process to where we actually reviewed all position requests for new faculty lines and tied them to where we needed those faculty the most, given, again, the goals within our plan, uh, where enrollment was increasing. So we changed that process so it wasn't just kind of doing things the way we've always done them. So that, that certainly is one of those examples. But again, some of that's at the campus level. I will say from a state level right now, and we just had a meeting last week, there's a commission looking at the, the funding formula for uh, Illinois public institutions. I suspect that they will come out with something. The nice thing, uh, while I say talking about aligning it with our goals, their goals are very much aligned with our goals. So, so anything that they come up with shouldn't be in contrast to what we're talking about doing here. So I think we're, we're in good shape with that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yeah, and, and a little bit, I would say, I think part of the work of the implementation team, so the question was about NSERC, um, and uh, you know that actually does do the, um, Carbondale Agriculture Dean sits on the NSERC board. Um, and as far as partnerships external to the institution, NSERC does a great job with that and has a lot of that kind of already in place. So how do we kind of, to your point, almost replicate that in, in some other areas? And I think that's part of what the implementation teams will be looking at is what can we do to help facilitate that? That certainly will involve um, incorporating a kind of a whole lot of different people across different program areas. But I think what we're looking for is how as a system can we facilitate kind of that initial discussion. I think when we get people talking together, they often find a lot of over, like I was joking about, you know, in an airport, sometimes you just start, sit down and talk with someone, you find there's overlap in interests and exciting opportunities can come from that. So we need to find ways to facilitate that more. Maybe, maybe not. And so what I'll say is, I think in any time we look at something, can we find an efficiency that would make us work better? There are some times where that actually wouldn't work. We still have to keep in mind, Zoom has changed the world for us, but we're still two hours apart from Carbondale and about an hour and 15 minutes or so away from Springfield. So sometimes having somebody physically present and, and having that staff actually here makes more sense. But I think we're constantly looking at 
where does it make sense to actually collaborate and where does it make sense to perhaps have individual units. But what I would say is even when we have kind of individual units and in say HR or whatever it is, are we doing as much as we can to actually have them talking together, sharing ideas, um, coming up with new strategies? And we've done a number of those things actually in the last couple of years. Um, the remote work policy was actually a collaborative effort from people from all, all the campuses. You know, things like that, can we find ways, even um, I asked for help uh, on how to do, assess the people who report to me, how to give more people input into that process. Again, we brought people together from across the system with different ideas. So using, again, the expertise we have across, even if we're actually not completely combining them together, still makes sense. You know, and there's multiple ways of thinking about rewards. And some of this, again, will be working with the campuses. And again, mostly that comes directly from the campus. Um, you know, sometimes some places I've been, I've actually tied some merit increase to that. So salary increase sometimes has been the case. We're not actually to the point where we have, I think, high enough salary increases to talk about that. But again, hopefully at some point we will be. I think the other thing sometimes is looking at our promotion policies and things like that. So how is that actually rewarded when we're doing that a promotion? Again, that's an individual campus level thing to some extent, but it doesn't mean we can't have conversations across the system about what's a model that has actually worked and been effective for people. And if it's any department on any campus that has done it rather well and try to find ways to incorporate that into other policies, um, that makes sense. So I think it's again sharing that idea. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, John. If I wanted to get some tea or water before I left, is there any way that it could <laughs> I think there's some right up there, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> and thank John for the tea and water since he ordered that. So that's why he's trying to, <laughs> he's trying to get credit for what he did. But thank you, John, for the tea and water. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. I appreciate your time.